what are you here for? Are you here to find out what the truth is? Or are you here to perpetuate ideologies that have been erroneously labeled onto all faiths, not just, not just the Christians or the Jews? I think if you really look hard, you're going to find that over time, everything gets perverted. Look, look at where we are right now. Okay. We have been studying the subject of the lost tribes. It, it's slipping away from me now, but I was in my office. I'm thinking, this is the 16th message on this subject. I didn't intend, by the way, <laughs> it's always like this. I didn't intend to make this a long series, but it's a big subject. And actually, the more I think about it, it's crucial for us to know. I want you to think about this. It's crucial for us to know who is who in the world because at the end, we come to the book of Revelation, or if you want to call it the end of time, a lot of these countries and entities, it will be important to identify who's who for prophetic reasons. So there is a good reason to study this, not just to see God's faithfulness and how uh, incredible when you begin to really pick apart. We've only glimpsed at the surface in all the messages thus far. I think we've only scratched the surface uh, looking at from obviously when the kingdoms of Israel divided, becoming north and south. And um, as I've mentioned, we've been focused primarily on the northern part, which is sometimes referred to as Ephraim or Samaria. And as I said, we've looked at the descendants of Jacob, Jacob who became Israel, his sons produced by two wives and two concubines. So let me stop right here because I have something that kind of ties into last week's message and is important as well for this week's message and for those who have questions, okay? Um, a lot of times people will take a controversy with something I say. And I want you to hear me out. Unlike, you may go to church somewhere else and it may be wah, 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 and wah, 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 and there's no, there's, it just, it is what it is, and you just go, okay, that's great, and you go about your day. I do and have said many things that appear controversial, but let me just tell you, if you are studying, for example, to get a higher degree, you must discipline yourself to read and look at materials that you otherwise would never look at. And sometimes reading those materials can open your eyes to a perspective or an understanding that you would not have gotten otherwise. So when I talk about certain things, what I'm actually aiming for, there's a target. It's to get to the truth, okay? And sometimes people don't like the truth when it when it busts their bubble. You know, you carry, especially when it comes to religion, you carry around ideas your whole entire life, maybe. And let's just say that they're false. And I've told you this story many times, December 25th. I remember hearing here, but I told you the story of Dr. Scott challenging me to find Christmas. He said, I, I can't remember how much money, but he said he'd give me X if I could find it in the Bible. And it's not there. I looked and it's not there. Wow, what a revelation. And then you start studying and you realize that December 25th is not the date that Jesus was born, but rather was a pagan celebration, the Saturnalia. And if you look back into history, ecclesiastical history, you can clearly see where it got grafted on because the church could not change the pagan ways, so if you can't beat them, join them, engraft it, call it Christmas, let's all celebrate this one day and that's that. And we're done with that and then through the ages we just all accept that. No one should ever ask a question, no one should ever ask where did this originate. I would like to tell you that I'm not the type of person who just comes into things and says, oh okay, well you said that so it must be true. I'm the person who says, well let me see, I want to look, let me take it apart, let me pull it stretch it, let me investigate, and then I will come to my own conclusion based on my own research. And that's exactly what happened, for example, with Christmas. Some, what, 25 years ago, maybe, maybe more. 
So when I talk about things and I say things, it is not specifically last week I was referring to a lot of Jewish customs. It is not to make people feel bad, like telling people Jesus wasn't born December 25th is not to make you feel bad. It's saying there is a truth that has not been told. The church has chosen to not tell the truth. So it's just, it's something like that. And here's one of these. Um, I was talking last week about customs, traditions, and I'm going to ask you, it's a rhetorical question. If you read the Old Testament, do you read that so-and-so was the mother of so-and-so and so-and-so's -and -so mother? It's all about the male lineage. Yes? Do you read anywhere? I mean, there may be one mention for some other purpose that a mother had children and they named the children. But by and large, I would go so far as to say that probably 99% of what is recorded genealogy speaks of male descent, male heirs, fathers and sons. And that's not because it's sexist. That is the way God designed to show lineage and genealogy. We're also talking about the day and age in which this was written, which I've said many times, women did not have any social standing or matter, their sole purpose was to bear children, period. And you can say, I don't like that, but that's the way things were during this period that we're looking at. Now, what, this is a delicate situation. I'm gonna give you an example of something. I just said, if you look at the Bible, you can see that everything is by male descendant. We would call that patrilineage. So why is it you get to modern Judaism. And when I say modern, I'm talking about anything, say, after two or 300 AD, forward. Modern Judaism professes that it is matrilineal, that you are distinguished by the mother's faith, by the mother being Jewish, the child is determined to be Jewish, but if you look for this in the book, you're not going to find that. And there's a big glossing. This is what is my frustration. I'm sorry, Abraham was not a Jew. He was not a Christian. He was not a Muslim. Get this straight. Don't say, well, we, we claim, well, everyone claims Abraham. And so the rabbis would like to use the fact that uh, the text that talks about how Abraham had basically conceived a child with Hagar, and that child was rejected. And based on that premise, it could only be the child that Sarai had that would count as descending. Well, that is true based on the promise, but it's not true on Jewishness because Judaism did not exist then. And what I'm saying is a bona fide fact. It's not hatred. It's not disdain. So according to Shane D. Cohen, the Lit Hour Professor of Hebrew Literature and Philosophy at Harvard, finds the matrilineal descent evolved from an original patrilineal descent. And hear me out, because we in Christianity have seen the same thing where things are inserted later and we call that part of our faith, but it's really not. And this is my, my plight, if you will. Because if you're going to use that, that it's by the mother, then tell me how we could include the children of Joseph, because Joseph married an Egyptian woman, and Ephraim and Manasseh took the place of Reuben as firstborn. You gonna answer that? You can't. And what about Moses? Because Moses also married a woman who was not part and parcel. They had children. What do you do with that? Are those children exed out because the mother is not part of what is a perceived religion, which by the way, again, this is very important. We may, the terminology I used may be incorrect when I say proto-Judaism, what they celebrated, what they did in the desert, but it is crystallized only after they return from exile because it is the tribe of Judah and perhaps the little sliver of Benjamin and the Levites who will keep the faith going that becomes Judaism. And God's word clearly says that the rest of the people will forget, they will abandon, they will no longer have a desire for. It says that as plain as day. So I'm asking the question, 
because it's in pursuit of truth, not because I want to stir the pot. How do you flop from its patrilineal in, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and when you get beyond the canon's close, all of a sudden somehow we change the rules and it becomes matrilineal? And do you understand why I'm talking about this? Because in pursuit of truth, sometimes you'll say things that people do not like because it burst their bubble on what they've believed their whole life. But I'm sorry, that's part of what I'm doing, is I'm trying to sort out the junk that we've been conditioned to believe versus sifting down and getting to the root of the truth. And I've said many times, even I have a lot of Catholic friends. And believe me, some of them get angry, some of them are, okay? But I've said this before, you show me where in this book, for example, where there were rosary beads. And we know I've taught the history of this. That's not to say, oh, well, you, as a Catholic, you shouldn't be doing the rosary. If you do that, just understand that it was never part of this book. It was never part of God's plan for you to count beads. I'm sorry, it's just not in there. And you can be mad at me and you can say, I don't like that, but what are you here for? Are you here to find out what the truth is? Or are you here to perpetuate ideologies that have been erroneously labeled onto all faiths, not just, not just the Christians or the Jews? I think if you really look hard, you're going to find that over time, everything gets perverted. Look, look at where we are right now. Just look at our country and how perverted we've become. So, you know, I would say save your your vitriol and your anger for something better because if you are in the pursuit of trying to find out what the truth is, Jesus says that the truth will set you free. And my mission is not to abase somebody else's belief. My mission is not to criticize or to say, oh, look at that stupid over there. I'm telling you, if we call ourselves people of the book, and the people of the book, by the way, make up Jews and Christians, then we ought to be going by this book to the best of our ability. We know one is perfect. And looking at what the book says becomes our compass and our guidelines and nothing more, nothing less. I'm not interested in what somebody came up with as a, a wonderful way to remember that you, it's time for you to pray. I mean, that may be like a mnemonic device that helps you for you, but it shouldn't be implemented at large into a faith that it never belonged in. So when I've talked about these things within Judaism, I, I realize we have a lot of Jewish listeners. And I'm saying to you, if you are going to be Jewish, or you are Jewish, then it's most important for you to know what you believe and why you believe it. Where is it? Not because a rabbi in later antiquity, and this is the thing, by the way, with this patrilineal, matrilineal. It was the rabbis of antiquity that changed this. So let me ask you something. What man or what woman has the right to change what God put in his book? No. Eh, all right. Okay, so uh, you, all, you all are on the same page, I guess. You're just looking at me like deer in the headlights. So uh, anyway, that's, that's what I want to make clear. So now, back to the agenda of where we are, because I, I think a lot of times people end up thinking, oh, you know, she must have, uh, she must not like these people. No. If you think that, you don't know me at all. I believe that, sorry, you may think this is a weird statement. God basically planted everything that is on the earth. Some of it is good and some of it is not good. Some of it belongs to him. Oh, no, all of it belongs to him, but some of it, some of it he says that's mine and some of it he says that ain't mine, all right? <laughs> And that's just the way it is, and you can, you can be angry at me, you can be mad, but this does require for people to be mature enough to look at the facts, and then listen, I'm not saying give up your beads or give up your lighting of candles, I'm not telling you that. I'm just saying know what you believe and why you believe it. That's all, end of story. Now, back to where we kind of were, which is we've been studying the lost tribes of Israel, and the bulk of our focus thus far has been on the tribe of Dan in the northern kingdom, a few auxiliary peoples that I've talked about and mentioned. So I'm going to step away from Dan a little bit today, and there's a reason. I kind of think that I need to fill out the map a little bit more, 
And as we fill out the map of people and places, then we can start putting prophetic um, scripture on top of each to see where everything lines up, which will probably take us eventually into the book of Revelation, Ezekiel, and Daniel to kind of round it out. But right now, the mission is to figure out who these people are. So I thought, what, what a good place to start, but the one who should have been first, that would be Reuben. So Reuben was Jacob, who became Israel's firstborn son, and Reuben had children of his own. So let's go to the record first, and... We'll find that record of the children. I've got so many stickers in my book here. Uh, we'll find the record of that. There's many places you can find it, but Genesis 46 and verse 9. And the sons of Reuben, Hanuk and Falu, or Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. So you have four children of Reuben, and something that I've not said before, which is we will see, as you comb the scriptures, you'll find out that, for example, these four sons become four distinct clans under the tribe of Reuben, but four distinct clans, that eventually when they start to branch out, these names will appear in the strangest places. So hold that thought. At the time of the Exodus, the tribe numbered 46,500 males above the age of 20 years old. And then there was a plague that hit the camp. Uh, their number, Reuben's number, was reduced to 43,730. Now, while they wandered in the desert for 40 years, Reuben's position was on the south side of the tabernacle, flanked by Simeon and Gad. And the tribe of Reuben were known for their great possessions, specifically cattle. Um, if you read, and I'll try to show you in as many places as I can, chapter and verse, so you can make notes. But 1 Chronicles 5, 3, you have the sons of Reuben again, chronicling Hanuk, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. Um, and if you read down, for example, it gives you more information. Verse 6 says, Berea, his son, whom Tiglath Pilneser, king of Assyria, carried away captive. He was prince of the Reubenites. So it's kind of interesting. You have a lot of pieces of information. But um, if you keep reading, I think it's, it might be that I did not write down the right verse, but we'll, I'll find it for you. Basically, they were rich in cattle. And this is why rich in cattle would translate into rich across the board. Because if you had cattle, you were very rich. Which might explain why in Judges, when Deborah is basically lamenting uh, why no one will come to the aid, you've got something said about Reuben. Um, here we have it here. It says, For the divisions of Reuben were great thoughts of heart, why abodest thou among the sheepfold to hear the bleedings of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. So it's interesting that while a battle is raging, they're more interested about their things, protecting their livestock. So put that in perspective. And then in Numbers 32, if you want to turn there, there's a lot of scriptural references we have to lay down. And I'm sorry for those people who don't have a Bible that can be very frustrating. That's why you should get one. Um, Numbers 32, at verse 37, And the children of Reuben built Heshbon and Ilya and Kirjathaim. So you can get an idea. And then something very confusing, which I'm going to have to address in a minute. But um, they also built Nebo, Baal, Mion and Shibma, names of the names of cities have changed. But if you read the account of the land assignment in Joshua 13, 15, it says the border describes the border of Joshua's territory, which is a little bit different than what's given here. And I'll explain why that may be said like that. You're gonna find that Reuben and Gad 
somehow will be clumped together. I mean, it's no secret that Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh were kind of clumped together anyway on the other side of the river. But we're going to find that there might be, even down the road, some commingling to bring some confusion between Reuben and Gad when we try to identify people. So kind of keep that as a note to self back there and don't go, when I get there, you might go, oh, that's confusing. Well, I'll tell you when I get to the confusing part, which <laughs> I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> but um, here's what we have. We have a record in First Chronicles that tells us that in the days of Saul, this tribe, the Reubenites, made war with the Hagarites. And it's only after the assassination of Ishbosheth that the Reubenites gathered with the rest of the tribes of Israel and proclaimed David as king. So we have a lot of, a lot of interesting and weird factoids, including this one. Um, you remember Korah? the event in the Bible mentioning Korah. Okay, this is an interesting thing. If you read that passage carefully, you'll find that these were actually not from a Levite band, but actually descendants of Reuben, which is very interesting and very bizarre. If you go back and read that, you'll, it'll be like, huh? That's very strange. But, okay, the number of fighting men that came to the area where the two and a half tribes, if you will, when they arrived in Hebron, would have been about 120,000 men. And there are two mentions of the Reubenites, uh, one being that the land was ravaged by the king of Syria, Hazael, in 1 Chronicles 5, 6, and we were just there. Let me read it again for those people who may not have a Bible, because I am sure there are plenty of my listeners who don't. So. First uh, Chronicles 5 and 6. So we have the carrying away, the, and it says, and his brethren by their families, when the genealogy of their generations was reckoned, and the chief, Jael, and Zechariah, and you keep, you keep going right down to verse 10. It says, in the days of Saul, they made war with the Hagarites who fell by their hand, and they dwelt in their tents throughout all the east land of Gilead. Keep reading down to verse 18. The sons of Reuben and the Gadites. It's interesting here, again, they're clumped together in the half-tribe of Manasseh, of valiant men, men able to bear buckler and sword and shoot with bow and skillful in war, were 44,703 score that went out to war. They made war with the Hagarites, with Jeddur, with Nephish, and Nodab, and they were helped against them, and the Hagarites were delivered into their hand, and all that were with them, they cried to God in the battle, and he was entreated of them because they put their trust in him. And that may be kind of, let's just say, the last uh, victory for Reuben for a while, if you will, because it seems that it kind of spirals downward from there. Um, I should make mention to those people. Remember, I've always said this is a one-room classroom, so there's people of all skill sets and understandings here. So for those people that don't know Reuben, the firstborn, should have received all the birthright blessings and everything that came with being the firstborn according to how the law of what's called primogenitor uh, is described. But because of something that Reuben did, um, basically he goes up to his mother's bed and defiles it. But in the scripture it says he went to his father's bed and defiled it with the handmaid. And so because of that deed, Basically, he loses his position as the law would have him be firstborn and receive the blessings. Um, you have a strange, strange passage that talks about him going out into the field and gathering these strange mandrakes, which is considered an aphrodisiac. Uh, and basically, you know, don't, don't get too crazy on this, but it, it will be... Uh, carried over as an emblem of Reuben as we progress in this message, you'll see. Now, what's important is something that God says about this particular tribe. Actually, it's, it's Reuben and Gad. That's quite disturbing. I'm going to read it from the King James first, and then I will read you what it says in the NIV, only because the NIV is like a hammer between the eyes. But Joshua 22:25.
speaking to this particular tribe, for the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you, ye children of Reuben and children of Gad, ye have no part in the Lord. Pretty strong words. So shall your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. What does the NIV say here? It says, the Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you, you Reubenites and Gadites, exclamation mark. <laughs> uh, I, I want to say that could have been a very Biden-esque moment. Never mind. <laughs> you have no share in the Lord, so your descendants might cause ours to stop fearing the Lord. So it's kind of interesting that you shall have no share. That's, those are pretty strong words. Now, Let's see what happens. We have to kind of look at some characteristics of Reuben. So, okay, Reuben's not the greatest moral character, okay? Going up and basically sleeping with his mother. Not great. But when we read about the story, if you remember, in all of Jacob's children that he had, the patriarch who becomes Israel, all of his children, Joseph was his favorite child. For good reason, we know if you read the passage and you read about it, you know why Joseph was the favorite child. And if you remember in the passage where uh, Jacob gives him that coat of many colors and he has dreams and he interprets them and the brothers are full of resentment because they think, you know, what a jerk, this, who does this guy think he is? And they come up with a scheme, the brothers do, basically to do away with Joseph. Let's be done with him. And the brothers basically come up with a scheme. They want to kill him, and it's, it's Reuben. That's kind of a surprise. It's Reuben that says, don't, don't do him any harm. Don't kill him. Basically, make a pit, throw him in the pit, and leave him there. Now, they end up throwing him in the pit. They present him basically as dead to the father, Jacob, but he's, Joseph is sold to a Midianite band of Ishmaelites coming through that take him to Egypt and sell him off to Egypt. And of course, you know the rest of the story, Joseph, Joseph is in prison for no reason, but actually there is a reason, God's plan. But it was Reuben that spoke up. No other brother said, wait, don't, uh, uh, uh. So we can say, okay, he had bad moral judgment on this side, but he did speak up, which is better than any of the brothers. Um, and that doesn't, by the way, make it okay. But if you think about it, uh, Reuben's plan in that passage was to return, basically, and maybe rescue his brother, but it didn't happen that way. So we all know how that goes. And so this is why when Jacob, Israel, is giving out the blessings, if you will, and has some prophetic words for all of his children before he dies. I'm turning to the last chapters of Genesis so I can read it with you. And we have some, if you will, blessings, but for Reuben it's not a blessing. So listen carefully to what happens. Genesis 49, Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, Thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it. He went up to my couch. So you've got that one word right there, and basically it's not a good word. So what we take away from this is that, obviously, very important, Reuben does not have a grand picture painted for him like Judah or like any other, it's really kind of bleak. But there are some positive words in there. When, when the patriarch Jacob says, uh, the beginning of my strength, I believe that was to say like my firstborn, the beginning, the genesis of this family, the beginning of my strength, the beginning of whatever would become the children of Israel, um, of the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. I think that that 
thought process was that's how he perceived he should have been, but that's not how it ended up. So we know that the birthright is the, the first place position is taken away and is passed on to the children of Joseph. E Ephraim and Manasseh are taken and adopted, and they basically get that, and sh they will share the package if you want. The birthright blessing package gets split between Ephraim, Manasseh, and the tribe of Judah. And respectively, they both have their, each has their blessings, if you will, and each has their proper role. And aside from that, it's kind of a very loose uh, understanding of what is meant in, we, we call, I wouldn't say their blessings anymore, I just say this is kind of the word going over. Unstable is water. So it's an, that's an interesting way of speaking of, of Reuben. Now what I have to, I have to tie this in somewhere, so this might be a good place to do this. I want you to recognize that once they move into, well, they will obviously go into bondage, and once they come out of Egypt's bondage, they will basically wander for 40 years in the wilderness, and eventually, as we have seen and as we have studied in the books of Joshua specifically, land will be allotted. And I just read to you the place in Joshua 22, 25 that says they shall have no part, even though they were given land assignment. So what's important, and I need to stress this because it becomes a large part of this message, the area where they settled, sometimes that whole area is referred to as Gilead, okay? Hold that thought for a second. This is where the confusion comes, so bear with me. The, the half-tribe of Manasseh is also settled in that area, and Manasseh's, the half-tribe of Manasseh's offspring will have a son named Mahir. And 1 Chronicles 7.14 says, Mahir, the offspring, is the father of Gilead. So Gilead is not only a piece or an area of land, but it is also a person. And this becomes important for a reason that I'm going to say right now. As we follow these people and as they begin to spread and migrate, that word Gilead will morph into other names. And just keep that in mind because they'll come up. But the names that we will encounter from Gilead, Galadi, Galati, Gali, Gala, Gal. And possibly from the tribe of Gad, Goti. So hold that part right there because when I say names will morph, I know this is Almost, again, a lot of information, but I will repeat this and I will try and disseminate it a little bit better. The idea here is that when we start looking at where these people went, we see, for example, a group of people that will be labeled as barbarians. Ooh, sounds terrible, right? But here's the problem. Not all barbarians were barbarians. They were labeled that way mostly by the Romans because they, it's like a label. They like labeling people. There's a label. These are barbarians. But certain people who were labeled barbarians will be known or become known as Franks. And the barbarians basically put them as a confederate of people, of different people. The Franks will eventually conquer the Gauls, and you say, well, aren't, are these one and the same? Well, they are, in a sense, brethren, but they don't know it, like most of these people. And other such groups, such as the Celts, this is something that I'll need to explain in detail, how these um, basically waves of people that are trying to fight for the land, and they'll fight, again, they don't know that they're fighting their brethren, but they are. Kind of sad if you think about it, if they could have, if we could have just hit a switch and said, hey, you're this tribe, you're that tribe, they would have, maybe they would have all held hands and sung Kumbaya. I don't think so. <laughs> Sorry, bad idea, I don't think so. But we'll also see the tribe of Reuben will be commingled with another group of people. You remember I referred to the Scythians. And the Scythians, remember I said, I tried to explain this in an earlier message. The Scythians can be broken down into two main groups and then Within the group that we'll be looking at, there are so many subcategories of Scythians, Saka Scythians, and there's a whole litany of names that will be identified with the Scythians. So let me just say, for people saying, well, can we ever identify exactly 
who the Scythians were. That's a little bit more difficult. When I say as in, can we look at and see these Scythians belong to this tribe or these Scythians, that's going to be very hard, but we can get a generic idea. And here's why. There was a group of people referred to and commingled called the Rahabani, Rahab, Rabhabani, Rubari, Rubi, Rubai, and Ruby. These are all people that are from the tribe of Reuben that are integrated into some of the Scythian groups. There's one more, by the way. If you remember in the sons of Reuben, there was one named Hanuk. So this is fascinating because in the clans of the Scythians, this is one where we can be specific. There is a clan called the Hanioki or the Hanioki, which, by the way, is one of the names of Reuben's sons, also the name of a sub-clan of Scythians. So in some areas, we'll be able to identify who these people were. In other cases, no. So this one we can, luckily. So here's what's mind-boggling. The Franks refer to themselves as Rubari, descendants of Reuben. The Franks were also known at some time as Huga or Hugi. Hold that thought, because some of you are already maybe hearing something going, oh, oh, oh. Huguenots, that comes later. Don't, don't commingle it. But it may be related, but it comes later, much, much later, because that's part of the Protestant movement. So you're talking centuries later. So hold that as well in your brain. But you have a commingling, as I said, between Reuben and Gad. And we know this for a fact because that name Huga, uh, or Hugi, or Hugia, uh, pops up, but it's actually a son or a descendant of Gad, not Reuben, that bears that name. So if you look up the origin of Huguenot. Some will attribute it to a man by the name of Hugh, and that comes, as I said, much later. Uh, I personally think it was a name given to the son of Gad that was passed down, that will be an, a name put on people that eventually becomes a movement. But we'll get to that too, because that's part of a history we'll have to burst wide open, and I love that. It's just that everything is kind of intertwined together. Now there's one more turn maybe more, but at least this one. <laughs> the people who are known to us as Galatians are actually connected to the Sumerians and the Scythians. So think of it this way. It's, it's possible that you've got groups that are migrating, and we know, for example, the scripture tells us this is where there's no ambiguity. Um, the scripture tells us that this tribe of Reuben, tribe of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, it says where they were carried away to in Scripture. Look that up for yourself and you'll find we've got at least three or four areas that they were dumped into. And as I told you, at some point we'll look at a map, but right now just you've got a, if you've got a Bible, you can maybe trace that in your own time. Uh, the important thing here is that there is a solid trace that leads us without question to looking at the country we will refer to in modern verbiage as France, and specifically the north of France. So this all becomes interesting for another reason. And I'm, now I'm interrupting myself for a sidebar because I can't help it. Those of us that believe that uh, at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that Joseph of Arimathea and others went to the south of France, and that we're talking about sometime after Christ's death and resurrection. So whatever date you want to put on that, let's call it the traditional 30 or 33 AD and the time that elapses, whatever time that was that they arrived. Think of this, if they did indeed, which I do believe they arrived in the south of France, the north of France for centuries had been occupied by descendants that, you know, if you think about it, it makes sense to see that these people who migrated to the north, that were there for a long time, who don't have an identity per se, they'll become known as Franks, and ultimately we've got, I'll, I'll walk you through all of the, the uh, passings of the torch from the Merovingian to the Carolingian and so forth, but uh, ultimately will be known as French or France, so I don't think it's an accident when you start to see all this activity 
about these different places. I don't think it's an accident then we can look to, we'll call it the later histories, and say, what would be so strange about those people going there? It's almost like a, a, a device, some type of magnet, if you will, that drew them to certain lands to, without knowledge, centuries later, reconnect with ancestry. That's pretty mind-boggling in and of itself, but that, you know, you can do with that what you want. All I know is that according to the historical writers, uh, the Franks were divided into two or many diverse groups, um, but the people that we know as the Sicambri, um, these are chronicled to about 450 BC, and then you've got a whole group of other people, but all of these tribes bearing different names, think of this, all these different names, but they all basically came from one or two sources. That's pretty staggering. And they don't, they don't know that they're related. That's even more crazy. So um, if you remember, I brought a chart, um, wrote the list of the kings, and Macomir was on one of those lists. He brought the people out of Scythia, conquered Gaul, where they settled before, and conquered what is now Holland, by the way, crossed the Rhine and conquered part of Gaul. And here they remained until they were called Franks, um, Franconians, and eventually the French. So here's what's interesting. Reuben, you can associate with the northern part of France and a little swath of Germany and a little spackling of Holland. But again, there'll be other tribes that will take up and basically dominate some of those places. But this is where we're finding them. So it may be safe to explain this in the most simplified terms. The, Fran the Franks that settled in France became, for the most part, what would, would have been emanating from the tribe of Reuben. And the Franks that settled in the part of Germany came out of different tribal clans. And those people will uh, essentially, you've got a separation that will occur between France and Germany. And of course, if you know a little bit of history, there will be an accord between the two countries uh, that basically binds these countries. And very interesting, if you're looking at the history of France, there's something very relevant as to what Jacob said about thou shall not excel. And it's really important. Because you see, probably what most people don't know is that the French gain momentum. Now, Bear with me, Clovis, the, he's not the first king of France, but a person named Clovis, 466 to 511, uh, he's king of the France, he's made ruler of much of Gaul, uh, and then we have a development of rulers that come. First it's the Merovingian kings, and then after that we've got a conversion, which happens, a mass conversion to Catholicism in that land, and then we've got the implementation eventually of the Holy Roman emperor that will basically govern or control a lot of Europe uh, at one point, but specifically and undoubtedly what is France and Germany will be under that powerful sway. When Clovis died, his kingdom was split between his four children. This is what's mind-boggling. So Reuben had four children and that clan of four, and we can see the division of the four children. It's interesting, Clovis dies, his kingdom is split before, between the four children. So Western Franks will become France, and Eastern Franks will become the greater part of what is known today as Germany. So kind of put that in your mind. And we've got some breadcrumbs still left over, some hold, holdout names. For example, think of this, Frankfurt, Germany. Now, who would have guessed, right? There's a lot of those. If you start looking, and especially what's super cool, go online and try and find an old, old map. And I'm talking about a map that's a couple hundred years old. And you will see names on there, on the map in these areas, that basically have either names identifying with the children or the offspring of Reuben. You've got a lot of Franconia. It, the names are unmistakable. So. You know, there may be people saying, are you sure about this? Yeah, I'm sure about this. Uh, the Rhine and the Moselle Valleys in Germany are still known as Franconia today. So where did that come from, right? All right, in 751 AD, Pepin the Short, or the Younger, became king of the Franks until his death. And he is basically the first Carolingian king. And why does that matter? 
because by, eventually by the time of his death and Charlemagne, we have, as I said, the implementation where the Pope gives his blessing. <coughs> and this individual basically is declared the supreme ruler. This power would last from about 800 to the 1800s, so a thousand years of what I would call dark rule over Europe. The French higher society and nobility would flatly reject the Carolingian successor, and they crowned the Duke of France, Hugh Capet, in 987. So a lot of people think that that is the name that originates going back if you're tracing the Huguenots. I believe it actually goes back further to a descendant of Gad. That is my opinion. I'll always tell you when it's opinion. Um, all right, so if you know French history a little bit, if you care, which I'm not sure that uh, we're here for that, but anyway, that was a very polite thing to say, wasn't it? <laughs> but from 1690 to 1760, France and Britain would battle for who would lay claim to North America. And we know that by 1760, the winner was clear. The British won one swath of land, which makes up basically what is Montreal and Quebec. But it, that didn't last long. Of course, the French and the English would still battle it out, and that's a whole different story. But you fast forward to the French Revolution. Ten years' worth of battling and bloodshed. And what comes out of the French Revolution is what's kind of disturbing, OK? Not that it wasn't there before, but humanism and secularism really take rise. And the God-fearing part of the country seems to kind of step back, cowering. That's why I said, if you read history, history is so important. It tells us these people should have never backed away or backed down. I mean, think about it. Their, their national declaration, brotherhood, liberté, freedom, who could, who could even imagine and they were bold declarations, but they didn't stand for anything. There was nothing to back it up. And we know that by the time Napoleon is dictator, and that short-lived, uh, if you want to say, career of his, um, and then we begin to see basically the decline. So thou shall not excel. They had their moment for a time. They were a force to be reckoned with. Really, if you think about it, and if you analyze many of the leaders, Frankish and others, in history, they were kind of weak and impotent. And I'm not saying that they all were. Some of them were very brave. But you've got a lot of kind of wishy-washy, I, I don't really want to fight. Let's be brothers. Let's be more than brothers. Let's kill each other. I don't know. So um, I think what I'm trying to say to you is it's important to realize that the apex of power came for them and then basically crumbled away and Ephraim, the British Empire, would ultimately put an end to all this. Um, I'm not going to give credit, in fact, I was discussing this this morning, uh, the error to think that it was the British and the Duke of Wellington that won the battle at Waterloo. It's a little bit different real version than what we've been given. But in any event, that all came crashing down and basically that is it. The desire and the ability for the French to take over and rule Europe crashed and burned. What I do find interesting, and I said this in passing, that France and Germany are tied by the Elysee Treaty signed by Charles de Gaulle. So getting back to Reuben, and if you remember, I mentioned the famous mandrakes. Well, Try and look up mandrakes. Find a picture of it online. You're going to see it looks much like the fleur de lis, the sign that became before there was the uh, colors, the tricolor. Uh, but the fleur de lis was the emblem of France. And I believe it's also the emblem of Quebec and some other French uh, speaking places. And that fleur de lis uh, actually, I believe, was the, the image, the emblem of the mandrake. You can look it up for yourself and see whatever you want. But the mandrake is supposed to be an aphrodisiac, if you recall, biblically. So I think it's interesting that the French have, they do, whether it's true or not, it's been a label put on them that they are the amoureux, the lovers, right? <laughs> so I don't know. Listen, you can say, oh, it's all coincidence, and I, je ne sais pas, right? Okay. <laughs> 
but I don't think so. In fact, I'll tell you something else. What's, what's equally fascinating to me is that the four sons of Reuben, of the original four sons, one of them's name is Carmi. And if you look up each of the children's names, they all have meanings. But Carmi's name means wine dresser or winemaker. And I don't, again, you could say, well, that's just mere coincidence. The French produced such great wine. But this is the lineage, if you will, of people that went and brought whatever their skill set was. In this case, it might just be uh, aphrodisiacs and wine. <laughs> <laughs> now, Ezekiel 48, 7 tells us that Reuben will have land appointed to it in the future. And in Revelation 7, 5, Reuben is there as well. So I don't want people to think somehow, uh, as people have done, by the way, with the tribe of Dan, they've said, well, Dan wasn't there because Dan engaged in idolatry. Well, they all did. So there's got to be another reason about Dan, but I'm saying to you, Reuben is there, and Reuben kind of has a kind of scummy beginning. I'm sorry, there's no other way to put it. If you think about it, what he did, not great. And yet God says he'll still be counted in the number. So there's two things, two thoughts I want to leave you with. One is the fact that Reuben tells me you can be a big mess up and God still has abundant grace to forgive you and take you in if you look to him, which I believe this is the whole premise of the end days and the final call when people will look to him once more. People that turned away, who don't care, who are disinterested, will look to him and be saved. So I think there's a, a message there regarding Reuben for all of us who may have stumbled and fallen over the course of time. Of course, it's all covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. But more importantly, let me just say, there may be some Reuben-type folks listening to me today that say, I've been too bad, I have done things unimaginable, there's no room for me. And I ask you and I urge you to look at the many people in the Bible, but Reuben is a prime example, not wiped off the map, not forgotten. He has a place there at the end. And I'm going to say to you who feel like maybe you've tripped and fallen maybe one too many times in a Reuben-esque way, God still has abundant grace. God's looking for sinners, not for the people who think they've arrived and are perfected. So that's one part of the message the second thing is I believe that there is a wonderful picture being painted that when God says, thou shall not excel, he let Reuben and the descendants of Reuben have their day, their, their grandeur at some point. He let them have that. But if you remember what I said, with the ushering in of humanism and secularism and the basically putting God on the back burner, God basically got confirmation that these people were not willing to fight for him. And, and I, say, I say a sidebar. It was the tribe of Reuben, or descendants of the tribe of Reuben, that actually came as crusaders to fight to take back the Holy Land. But that was also short-lived and fell apart real quickly. So it's as if God is saying, can you hear me now? Because unstable is water, thou shalt not excel. But God still said, I've got a day of grace for you. And no matter what you've done, Reuben, or put your name in there, I have more than enough grace if you'll turn to me and turn back to me. And this is why we're studying this, to put the seeds of understanding of all of these different countries, their highs and their lows. And again, you can't cover a, a country's history in 20 or 30 minutes. That's impossible. So I've given you the We'll call it the bullet points if you want to go look it up for yourself and do some more research. In fact, I brought with a book. I'm famous for doing this, bringing books and not reading from them. <laughs> wow, I must have ESP or something. I, I read without opening the book. But this is, um, this is a book by Lore Publishing, Regnery, France and Germany. And so that I give proper credit here, um, copywritten in 1964. And this, by the way, just confirms if you're interested, because some people think, you know, there's a lot of people that listen, they think I make stuff up, and I tell you, go and look this up. You can't actually make this stuff up. It's too crazy, right? Many centuries ago, two peoples, the Celts and the Germans, lived side by side in Germany, the former in the west and south, occupying lands as far as the Weser and the Danube, 
the latter toward the lower Elbe and Jutland, and probably extending eastward as far as, Vis as Vistula. These were the first Franco-German contacts, according to Greek and Latin writers, whose statements go back to 500 BC. These two peoples were unusually alike. They can pass for brothers, wrote geographer Strabo. For many years, Mediterranean peoples had difficulty in telling them apart, which is why I've been saying to you they are all related. And if you were, if I had the time to read on, there is a section here that says the Franco-German Empire. Starts like this, it is rather commonly accepted idea that Clovis, the Merovingian Frank, founded the Kingdom of France, and that another dynasty, dynasty, more exactly, its most famous representative, extended France's sway to Germany and to Italy. In other words, France is said to have annexed the two countries. In fact, however, Clovis was never king of France, but king of the Franks, a Germanic tribe which had come from the mouth of the Rhine, and this is something quite different. If these Franks pushed other Germans, and had moved over towards Spain, Clovis would still have been their king. As it happens, he settled in France after destroying the Burgundian and Visigoth kingdoms, and so on it goes. So this is not a fabrication. This is not uh, mythology. This is history and God's word of prophecy all coming to pass. We've got a lot more territory to cover, but I'm hoping that this will be enough of an introduction to Reuben, that we can start, as I said, important seeing how people will play out in the last days. Let me just say this one thing. You hear a lot about France attending these super summits and all of these meetings, but France is no longer, in God's book, is no longer a power player. They may be sitting at the table, but they are not holding all the cards. So you can kind of check one box and say, that country, it's not going to even have sorry, will not have an impact prophetically towards the end of time. The only place that it may have, as I said, if God does indeed do what he says, which is seal the preachers of righteousness out of the tribe of Reuben, and only will we know then who those people are. But as, in terms of a force to be reckoned with, in terms of anything else, they had their day. Now we'll be looking at other countries that we do have to consider in terms of prophecy, what their roles will be and how it will unfold. But for right now, you can kind of rest easy here. Ruben's done his thing, and that's that, and that's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call one 800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.